uh, for five minutes for questions. Um, during the recent 2018 Space Weather Workshop in Colorado, several presentations alluded to the private and academic opportunities within the overall space weather enterprise. Uh, these opportunities include the Space Weather Technology Research and Education Center at the University of Colorado in, uh, in Boulder. Cool and, amen. And the uh, possible use of future OneWeb commercial satellites uh, as polar orbit environmental sensors. What other opportunities, especially in forecasting and prediction analytics, are available uh, for the private and academic sectors to help NOAA, the Air Force, and NASA to accomplish space weather goals? And, uh, Dr. Jacobs, I'd like to direct that to you first. Uh, the, the, the two primary uh, things would, would be observations and, and forecasting. So we need observations both to initialize the predictions <coughs> as well as to verify the forecast. So it's, it's, it's impossible to improve a forecast unless you have observations for verification. The current state of the forecasting is we, we essentially see an event occurring on the sun and then we can predict how that will impact the earth. But there's, there's, there's really no way to predict when these events will occur other than some, some weak probabilistic guidance. And that, I think, is, is where the, the future of the research needs to focus, is actually predicting the onset of these events, not what happens once they occur. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Spann, could you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, yes, I think that um, uh, understanding and, and being able to predict these events is really tied to the fundamental understanding of what's going on. <clears throat> And uh, as we all try to identify our swim lanes, and I'd like to take that analogy a little further, I think where we want to go is actually synchronized swimming. <laughs> and so, um, but right now we are identifying our swim lanes and understanding what roles we each other play, um, each agency play. And, and for NASA, that is really providing that fundamental understanding. And uh, as we um, not only um, have uh, launched these new missions, which are really targeted, we also have a, a new uh, space weather application, science application program that we're rolling out, which will uh, allow competed opportunities very specifically tied toward transitioning the science uh, research uh, to the, an operational scenario. And that will certainly engage the academic and industry uh, very heavily. And so those are the two areas where I would say um, where we can get to the synchronized swimming scenario. Well, we were just talking about Esther Williams, and uh, so that's a, that's a good analogy. Um, and what, what either the, the other two, uh, Dr. Gibson or Dr. Uh, Tabiska, would you like to elaborate on that, uh, if, you, if you would? Sure, yeah, I would just comment that there's, there's different kinds of observations that are needed, right? I mean, there's the observations we need to make progress in the fundamental <coughs> science, and this is the, the real cutting edge new big telescopes, new, different vantages. One of the, the, the exciting opportunities is to take observations from a place in the, um, the sun's orbit where you can look back and see a CME moving from the sun to the Earth. And this is something that the European Space Agency may actually take on and be an incredible complementary asset to our observations, which are looking right along the sun-Earth line. You take that a little for, farther, and you could observe from above the sun's poles looking down, and you would get that same operational benefit of seeing uh, eruptions go from the sun to the earth, directed at the earth, and yet you'd get other scientific benefits as well. So there's exciting opportunities for moving forward in the fundamental research. And then there's other observations we need to basically have the best possible operational capabilities. And some of these are the ones we know about, like the Lasco coronagraph um, and the observations of the just upstream of the earth. And these we have to maintain so we can keep doing as well as we are now, but there may be new operational assets that as we move forward in the fundamental science, we identify um, observations that can make us actually do better in terms of the operations. Um, and then finally, the other kind of observations that we need in the benchmarking activity. There are applied science goals. In the benchmarking activity, one of the things they tried to study was the, the uh, geomagnetic activity and the, and the ground currents, the, the, how extreme they could get. To do that, they needed um, magnetometers on the ground and also magne magnetotelluric surveys, which tell you about the ground conductivity. And they found that only about half of the US was really covered by these observations. And this represents another gap that we need. So we just keep finding new things that we need okay, to observe. Thank you. And Dr. Tabiska. 
Yes, just a uh, one or two comments. I would really uh, like to echo uh, my other colleagues who emphasize the, the uh, observations needed uh, of the material coming from the sun to the earth. Right now, we are really at the point like the tr uh, tropospheric weather community was 50 years ago. We're just a half a dozen cities making temperature measurements. We can't predict when the snow is going to cover, come over the mountain unless we look out the window. Now, we, we need to have the thousands and tens of thousands of measurements in that realm. They don't exist yet. Plus, there's other measurements all downstream for other technologies. But if we could solve that viewing of what's coming at us from the sun, knowing the velocity and the directionality of it to get the magnitude, that would be a big deal. Right, thank you. I have about five other questions, but I'm out of time. A lot of them are, I really would like to hear